Good morning. Good morning. All right. It's good to see everybody here. Thank you for coming. Um, Pastor Jared is playing hooky today. So, you know, they say um, when the cat's away, the mice will play. So, so we're going to have a good time today. Uh, <laughs> but we're not, we're not here to come see Jared every week. We, no. Sorry, Jared, but we really don't care. Um, <laughs> Okay, Jared, you're online. You heard that. Oh, oh yeah, we, we broadcast it, this, don't we? Sorry, Jared, we definitely come for you. Uh, no, we're here to praise God, right? right. Amen. So that's what we're going to do. Let's go ahead and stand up and sing together. Oh, 
right. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. There is good news for the captive. Good news for the shame. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one religion failed. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. That's a great song, right? What great news. Because uh, we're sinking a lot, aren't we? And we need a rescuer. Um, so that I am so thankful. Um, I want to take just a couple of seconds to invite you. If you don't know you're invited, you're personally invited by me to come tonight at 5 o'clock. We're going to have a potluck. Bring your best dish. Show it off. And uh, Kyle's always clapping for potlucks, in case you wondered. <laughs> Kyle likes food. Um, and then at 6 o'clock... Uh, we have worship night outside. This is all going to be outside in the yard, so bring your lawn chair, bring your pot, your dish, and um, I want to, uh, hands, Who? where's my choir? I got some Woo! choir people in the room. You see these people? These people have put in some time. I've got some kiddos in a choir down here somewhere. There's some kiddos in the choir. Um, it's going to be a great time. It's not just the band. We've got all the church invited in, and we would love to have you all there. Bring your friends. It'll be a great place to hang out in the park. The kids will play. So, uh, with that, um, we're going to go into uh, just one more worship song before uh, the sermon that today. And I've been reading um, something about uh, worship in the church, and it really talks about the fact that um, we do lots of great things with praise, and, you know, God is good, and we are saved. And those are our great words and really important for us to really lock in our hearts. But there's a space in worship for confession and lament, right? 
um, there's a space for us to say, God, I get it wrong a lot, and, um, and I'm hurting, and where are you? Um, and this song was born out of that a long, long time ago. It's a newer version. We've sung it before, but we're going to sing it as well um, and just kind of live in that space of even though I lament and times are hard, I believe in God and I believe in his purpose and his um, redemption for my life. So let's sing that. Grand new earth is quake before Moved by the sound of his voice Seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard Through it all
Most of the time, that's because we're trying to fix it and we're trying to hold it. And we're not turning to you. All through the Psalms, there are cries of God, where are you? What am I supposed to do? Why are my enemies winning? But those are so quickly followed by God. You are good and you are powerful and you are mighty and you want what's best for me and I trust you. So God, we, we want to work at, at it being well. Not that we would just gloss over what's hard, but God, that we would truly accept when you say that, that you will work good in the hard things, you will work good in the bad things when we trust and love you. So God, we trust and love you. Help us to be strong. Give us that reminder to turn to you in our lament and not to just lament. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, good morning, Lake Taps. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm here with you, kind of, but not here with you. And the, the reason is, I want to quickly explain, uh, I'm actually in Boston right now with my oldest daughter, Anne. She's four and a half. And we are visiting my brand new nephew. So my sister lives in Boston. She just had a baby. And it, it's really kind of a, a, a miracle, kind of God type of thing, because uh, my sister and her husband had uh, been trying to have kids for a long time, almost 10 years. And, you know, kind of after some testing, realized it's not really in the cards for them. And, and, and so, uh, but then last Christmas, they went on a trip to Costa Rica and they came back pregnant. And so it's really kind of a miracle, something to celebrate. And so the, the baby was just born a couple days ago. And I didn't think I was going to be able to come, come see my new nephew uh, because plane tickets are just ridiculously expensive. But then last minute, a couple days ago, the plane tickets got cheap. And so uh, the, the prices dropped. So I was able to, to get a ticket and last minute kind of make this trip happen. Uh, so yeah, that's why we're doing it this way. Um, hope you all are having a wonderful morning so far. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to um, kind of jump straight into the message for today. We're, we're in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, but first I wanted to share a, a story about my, my oldest daughter, Anne. Uh, if you were with us a couple weeks ago, you know uh, my family went to a, a, a middle school summer camp, uh, and, and I was the guest speaker there. And so while we were there at the camp, uh, obviously it's a summer camp, so there's a swimming pool. So the family went swimming, and uh, it was so fun. Kids obviously love uh, water and swimming, and, and so Anne, she was just giggling and having so much fun, and, and Anne doesn't know how to swim yet. We're planning on doing some, some swimming lessons soon, uh, but at this point, she doesn't know how to swim, so she had a floaty. We were right there next to her the whole time. It was safe, uh, but man, she's giggling, and, and she was gaining these, this confidence, and, and just out of nowhere said, I can swim all the way across the pool. And I'm like, no, Ann, you cannot swim at all, let alone across the pool. And she's like, yes, I can. I can swim. And no, you can't swim. You don't understand what swimming is. You're, you Don't swim across the pool. It's not safe. Stay here in the shallow end of the pool. Because she's just bouncing in the shallow end with her floaty. And, and even though I explained multiple times, you can't swim. You don't know how to swim. Don't try to swim, please. She didn't listen to me. And, you know, as soon as, as a parent, you know, you look away for three seconds and she's, she's taken off going to the d deep end, trying to swim. And then she, you know, let's go of the, of the floaty. And it, it, it really only took like three seconds and she dips underwater. I was still right there. So, you know, she dipped under and immediately I picked her back up and she's, you know, sputtering water. She was fine. It's actually a really good uh, teaching lesson, uh, teaching moment for her. Um, but it's like, Ann, I told you, you can't swim. But she, she had this confidence. She did not listen to me. And she tried to do it her own way, and it didn't work out well for her. Uh, and, and there's a reason I, I tell you that story. It's, it's a good example that's going to help explain today's passage a little bit. And uh, so, so like I said, we're in the series of Matthew, because as a church, we want to regularly uh, place ourselves at the feet of Jesus uh, at the, and just learn about his life and what he taught and who he is and just draw close to his heart so that we also 
can live in the way and the heart of Jesus as his followers. Uh, So with that in mind, let's read Matthew chapter 11, starting at verse 15. Uh, Actually, starting at verse 16. So Jesus is saying, To what will I compare this generation? It is like a child sitting in the marketplaces, calling out to others, We played the flute for you, and you didn't dance. We sang a funeral song, and you didn't mourn. For, For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. Yet the human one came, eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunk, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved to be right by her works. Then he began to scold the cities where he had done his greatest miracles because they didn't change their hearts and lives. How terrible it will be for you, Teresan. How terrible it will be for you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles done among you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have changed their hearts and lives and put on funeral clothes clothes and ashes a long time ago. But I say to you that Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you. And you, Capernaum, will you be honored by being raised up to heaven? No, you will be thrown down to the place of the dead. After all, if, if the miracles that were done among you had been done in Sodom, it would, be, it would still be here today. But I say to you that it will be better for the land of Sodom on the judgment day than it will be for you. At that same time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have shown them to babies. Indeed, Father, this brings you happiness. My Father has handed all things over to me. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wants to wants to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Put on my yoke and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. Man, there, there, there's a lot going on there. Uh, and so I, I, I want to unpack all of those things. But basically, there's kind of four overall themes in this passage. The first one is the comparison of Jesus and John. And then the second theme is where Jesus is calling out those cities and, and really just laying into them a little bit. And then the, the third thing is Jesus claiming to be the only one to the Father, where Jesus has that prayer there. And then the fourth theme is, is the easy yoke of Jesus, that invitation he gives there at the end. Come to me, all you who are who are tired and heavy burdened. And, and so we'll just kind of go in order as the passage goes and, and unpack all of this. There's some really, really beautiful things in all of this. Um, so, so first off, at the beginning, Jesus is voicing some frustration. He's, he's calling out that present generation because they refuse to be satisfied. And, you know, it's kind of understandable. John, when you look at the story, John comes onto the scene and he's living very differently from everybody else. He lives out in the wilderness, not in the city. His clothes are different. He eats locusts and honey, not normal food. And, and so he's very different. All the while, he's calling attention to the kingdom of God. And, and for that, everyone looks at him and thinks, man, that guy's got a demon, right? What's, what's wrong with that guy? I, I don't trust him because he doesn't act like the rest of us. So then Jesus comes onto the scene, and Jesus is eating and drinking like everybody else is. And he's calling attention to the kingdom of God. And everyone looks at Jesus and says, mm, he's got a demon, yeah, like, look, he's eating and drinking with, with some questionable people there. Jesus can't be trusted. <laughs> so it's like, man, which is it, right? You, you, you had both sides of the coin and you rejected both of them. But, but when we read these words from Jesus and, and when we see him condemning and calling out these people, it, as, as well in the next se- section when he's calling out the cities, I think we miss the tone of voice that Jesus is taking here. You know, we often see anger in his voice, and, you know, he's just being fed up with these people, like, come on, what's wrong with you people? And, you know, it's understandable when you look at the context, like, that's how I would feel in this type of circumstance. But that isn't how Jesus is is saying it. That's not the tone of voice that Jesus has. Uh, William Barclay, a, a theologian, Uh, comments on this, and he explains, saying, this is not the accent of one who is in a temper because his self-esteem has been touched. It's not the accent of one who is blaming with anger because he has been insulted. 
It is the accent of sorrow, the accent of one who, who uh, offering men and women the most precious thing in the world and saw it disregarded. Jesus' condemnation of sin is holy anger, but the anger comes not from outraged, uh, outraged pride, but from a broken heart. That's the key there. It, you know, similar to, to when Anne was trying to swim across the pool, and, and once she recovered, I, I was sternly saying, like, well, I told you not to do that. Are you okay? You're not ready for that. You know, I, I wasn't mad at her. I was concerned for her well-being, and that emotion was coming up, like, oh, my goodness, why would you do that? That's not good for you. So Jesus isn't being mad that he's being reje- rejected. He's not offended there. It, it's breaking his heart. He alone has the cure to what is killing everyone, and yet they, they refuse to listen to him. And so the, this first part is also a great lesson for leaders, or honestly, like anybody in this room and anybody listening. Like, no matter who you are, no matter what you do, <laughs> you can't please everybody. You know, someone will always find fault with you. Even Jesus, the Son of God, was not pleasing everybody. You know, John has a demon. Jesus has a demon. Well, what do you want? You had both sides, and you didn't like either. And so the the reality is, for all of us, is that being a people pleaser will make you a failure in life. You will never reach total success. There will be always be somebody not satisfied with what you're doing. And so I'm not trying to be harsh. That's just the reality for us. So, so live your life to please God, and success is possible. Live to please people, and you will be a failure your whole life. Now, let, let's look at the second section of, of this passage, where Jesus is scolding. He's calling out uh, a couple different cities that, that he's been to. So these aren't like cities that he hasn't visited. He's visited them. He's done mighty miracles there. And that's why he's calling them out. Uh, When you read the Gospels, you'll see that some of Jesus' sternest warnings are reserved for those who refuse his call to follow him. Why is that? Well, was he just angry? Was he calling down a curse on them? No, not at all. These warnings that he's giving are among the most sober and serious words that he's ever said. He lived in Capernaum. That's his hometown. You know, so he knew these people. They were his friends, his neighbors, the baker where he bought bread. Like, he knew them. He lived with them. And he knew Chorazin and and Bethsaida as well. They they were just a short walk uh, along the Sea of Galilee. And, And he knew now that despite all the remarkable, amazing, miraculous things that he's done, that those people were just bent on going their own way, following their own version of the kingdom of God. And and Jesus knew where that would lead them. So he wasn't calling down a curse on them, like, you rejected me, so shame on you, curses on you. No, he was speaking to them, and it was basically one last plea to them to listen to him. Please listen to me. His heart is breaking for them. He, he's watching them walk towards the end or try to swim towards the end of the deep, the deep end of the pool, ignoring his, his pleas to turn around, stop, don't go to the deep end of the pool, and they're just doing it. He's like, no, stop it, you're going to drown. Uh, the, the theologian N.T. Wright explains more on this. He says, their vision, this, the cities that Jesus is addressing, their vision of the kingdom was all about revolution. Swords, spears, surprise attacks, some hurt, some killed, winning in the end. Violence to defeat violence, that's how they thought that the Messiah would come and liberate and bring freedom to Israel, is all this violence. A holy war against unholy warriors. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. If he slaps you on the cheek or makes you walk a mile with him, stab him with his own dagger. That's the sort of kingdom vision that they had. So Jesus then says that, you know what, it's basically to be... It's better to be Sodom and Gomorrah, which is, that's a story from Genesis, where fire and brimstone comes raining down on them because of they're just totally depraved and horrible. Um, so it's better to be them than to be fighting God's battles with the devil's weapons. Let that sink in for a moment. It's better to be Sodom and Gomorrah than to be fighting God's battles with the devil's weapons. Ah, oh, but the end justifies the means. No, the way to the end is just as important. The way of the kingdom of God is different from the way of the world. 
The way of Jesus is different. So Jesus was offering a, a last chance to, to embrace a, a different kingdom vision. He'd outlined it in, in his great sermon, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, and, and he was teaching and he was giving that, that sermon to, to all the surrounding towns and villages all over Galilee. And he was showing how powerful the, the kingdom was with his healings and his miracles, and, and the people didn't want it. They were ready to use any excuse. You know, he's got a demon, he's a drunkard and a glutton. They were using any excuse to avoid the issue. So, so stop and think about what, what are the excuses that people use today to avoid the issue of the kingdom, the call of Jesus to follow him. Well, I'm, I'm just too busy. The, uh, the church is so corrupt and hypocritical. I don't want to be a part of that. Uh, I'll get to it later in life. Right? Or uh, the, the Christianity is, is just too old to be relevant for today's world. Or, um, I don't know, these, these, this Jesus stuff, the gospel, the Bible, it doesn't fit my political views. Hmm. So William Barclay asks the question, he's a theologian, he asks the question, what was the sin of these cities? Jesus is calling them out, but what was their sin? The people in these towns did not attack Jesus. They did not drive him from, from their gates or seek to, to crucify him. They simply disregarded him. They disregarded him. The crowds would gather when he came. They would listen to his teaching. They would watch his miracles. They'd probably even cheer when something great happened. But they wouldn't follow him. It, it was more about fascination than faith for these crowds. It was more about fascination than faith. So don't let that be said about you. Jesus is fascinating, yes, but he calls us to follow him, not just be impressed by him, not just to admire him, but to follow him. And so after that, the, the third section of this passage is, is Jesus begins to pray out loud for the benefit of those listening. And, and he praises God because God has hidden the mysteries of the kingdom from the wise and the intelligent and has shown the answers of, the, of the, those mysteries to babies, Jesus said. And so we need to be careful to, to see this clearly of what, what does Jesus truly mean here? He, he is very far from condemning intellectual power. That's, that's what some people think, that uh, it's, it's, he's against intellectual power. That's not it. Jesus is condemning intellectual pride. There's a difference there. As the scholar A. Plummer puts it, the head, not the heart, is the home of the gospel. So it, it's not cleverness with which... Uh, which shuts it out. It's pride that can shut out the gospel. Christianity is, it's, it's not a religion where you check your brain at the door, like if you want to be a Christian, you can't think. That's not the case at all. But the, we do need to know that it's easy for our, our own pride, the pride in our own wisdom and our own logic and our own intellect, that can shut the door to our hearts. And so we need to be careful in that way. And so then after that, Jesus says, no one knows the Son except the Father. And nobody knows the Father except the Son. What Jesus is saying here is, is basically this. He's saying, if you want to see what God is like, if you want to see the mind of Christ, the, the heart of God, the, the nature of God, if you want to see God's whole attitude toward men and women, then look at me, says Jesus. Paul writes in Colossians 1.15 saying that the Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God the one who is the first over all creation. In, in John's gospel, his, his account of Jesus, uh, he records Jesus making the claim saying, I, Jesus, am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So do you want to know who God is? Look to Jesus. What is God like? get to know Jesus. This isn't trying to be exclusive. It's not trying to cut people out. It's just simply stating the truth. It's stating reality. There's only one way to God, and that is through Jesus. It's not through being good. It's not through, you know, like all, all religions lead to the same God. That's not the case. That's not true. You know, in the same way that you can't jump on, on Highway 410 and expect to just show up in Seattle, you'd have to make a lot of other turns and jump on some other highways. If you stay just on 410, you will never get to Seattle. 
That's just a reality. 410 is not being exclusionary and, and you know, saying, oh, you're not allowed to go to Seattle. That's just, it's just reality. This road takes you here. That road takes you here. And it's, it's the same thing. If you want God, Jesus is the only way. And so then from, from that idea, then Jesus transitions into his final thought. And, and this transition is super important. And I'm really excited about to, to share some of these things with you. Because after establishing that he is the only way to God, he describes himself. In, in the four gospel accounts given to us, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's 89 chapters of biblical text. And there's only one place where Jesus tells us about his own heart, where Jesus describes himself. You know, you can, write, you can read all these theology books and commentaries where everybody else is talking about Jesus. This is who he is. This is what I think he's like. But there's one place where Jesus says, hey, guess what? This is who I am. This is what I'm like. And it's right here in this passage. So depending on your translation, Jesus calls himself gentle and lowly or gentle and humble. There's an incredible book called Gentle and, and Lowly, and, and I highly recommend it to, to everyone. It's, uh, it, it's beautiful. It's fascinating. It really uh, paints the, uh, a beautiful picture of the heart of Jesus, and you really get, feel closer to him and understand who Jesus truly is. Um, but, but, but anyways, you know, when, when Jesus describes himself, he doesn't tell us that he's exalted and dignified, he, he, we're not told that, that he's joyful and generous in heart. No, Jesus says, I'm gentle and lowly and humble. When Jesus speaks for himself, that's how he describes himself. N.T. Wright comments on this saying, when, when Jesus declares here in the old translation that he's meek and lowly in, of heart, he isn't boasting that he's attained some sort of special level of spiritual achievement. He's encouraging us to believe that he isn't going to stand over us like a policeman. Uh, he, he's not going to be cross with us like an angry school teacher. And the welcome that he offers for all who abandon themselves to his mercy is the welcome God offers through him. This is the invitation which pulls back the curtain and lets us see who the Father really is and encourages us to come into his loving, welcome presence. Jesus is gentle and lowly. He, he is that, basically that means he is approachable. He, he's not too good for you. He's not high and mighty. He is gentle and lowly. That is who he is. He's not trying to be that way. He's not just putting on that attitude. That is who he is. So you can come to him and he will welcome you because he is gentle and lowly and humble. And so now I, I want to read to you the, the invitation that Jesus gives us. He, and starting uh, at Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, Come to me, all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Put on my yoke and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. I have so much to say on this, probably not enough time to say everything I want to say. Uh, but first we need to define yoke. He, he, Jesus says, put on my yoke and learn from me. Well, what is a yoke? Like an egg yoke? Like that's weird. What Jesus, what are you talking about? So if you look up a yoke, so a yoke is simply a wooden cross piece. And we have a picture of this. It's a wooden cross piece that is fastened over the necks of two animals. And it's attached to the plow or a cart that they're to pull. So it's basically, it's, it's a working, it's a work tool for cattle. And, and so at first glance, if, if you step back and actually think about this, this is a very odd thing for Jesus to be offering to us. He's offering us his yoke. Well, what does that mean, Jesus? And, and so on that idea, Frederick Dale Bruner comments in his commentary with this incredible insight. It's so beautiful. So, so he says this, a yoke is a work instrument. Thus, when Jesus offers a yoke, he offers what we might think tired workers need least. They, you know, they, they need a mattress or a vacation, not a yoke. Jesus realizes that the most restful gift he can give the tired is a new way to carry that life, a fresh way to bear the responsibilities. Realism sees that life is a life of succession of burdens. We cannot get away from them. Thus, instead of offering escape, Jesus offers equipment. 
It's beautiful. Let that sink in for a moment. Instead of offering us an escape, Jesus offers us equipment. Why is that? Because life is it's a succession of burdens, right? Uh, if, if you're a parent, you, you know, you got a toddler and they have phases, they have stages. Oh, this is a hard stage. Oh, this is, a, you know, the, the, the terrible twos. Oh, but then you have the terrible threes. So, you know, as soon as they grow out of one stage, yay, you know, they're not acting that way. They find a new way to be difficult as a kid. And you know, so it just never stops. It's just a succession of difficulties and challenges. And, and work, you know, it's just one project after another or one date or event that you're working towards. And then there's another date and event and it, there's just, it never ends. There's always something else. It's always a succession of burdens, one after another. No matter where you are in life, whether it's school, there's always another assignment. Whether it's work, there's always another project or, or whatever it is, an, another, yet another coworker you have to work with, yet another customer you have to serve. W- whatever it is, parenting, it's a succession of burdens. It is. It really is. That's why there's so much stress and anxiety in the world. There's no escape from it. Like, yeah, you can go on vacation. You can take a nap. But eventually that vacation ends and you have to go back to work. Eventually you wake up from that nap in the beautiful dream and you're back in the real world again. So escape is not the way. It's, it's, it doesn't help you necessarily. So Jesus offers us a new way to carry these burdens because you can't get rid of the burdens. You have to carry them. So Jesus gives us a new way to carry them. He offers us equipment to make the job easier. So what is the yoke of Jesus then? That's our, that's our question. It's a way of life. The yoke of Jesus is a way of life, a way of understanding the virtues and values of God's kingdom. In, in the Jewish world, yoke is a common metaphor for the Torah, the Old Testament law. And so if you've ever read the Old Testament law, you know, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, man, it's a burden just to read them, <laughs> let alone try, try to live according to the, to the Old Testament law. And man, that is burdensome. Like it's, it will be exhausting. It's impossible to, to know whether you're checking all the boxes in the Old Testament law. Like it's unbearable to do that. And the yoke of Jesus is his interpretation of the law. Or, or better yet, even, it's the new covenant, the new law that he gives us through his death and his resurrection, the way of the kingdom. It's a way of living life in the way and the heart of Jesus. Dallas Willard explains it this way, saying, And in this truth lies the secret of the easy yoke. The secret involves living as he, Jesus, lived in the entirety of his life, adopting his overall lifestyle. That's the secret. Following in his steps cannot be equated with behaving as he did when he was on the spot. To live, as Christ, to live as Christ lives is to live as he did all his life. The general human failing is to want what is right and important, but at the same time to not commit to the kind of life that will produce the action we know to be right and the condition we want to enjoy. This is the feature of human character that explains why the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We intend what is right, he says, but we avoid the life that would make it reality. This is the key to not only do the right things when the spotlight is on us, but to do the right things when the spotlight is not on us, when nobody is looking. Th- think of like a, an elite athlete, like in the Olympics, a runner. Usain Bolt, I think, has the, you know, the world record and the 100-meter dash or something. So, you know, he breaks the world record. People see it on TV. And so everyone's like inspired and, and, you know, like, oh, man, that's so cool. Usain Bolt is the man, whatever. And so kids suddenly want to be that person. They sign up for the track team at high school. You know, they, they want to win a race. They want to break the record. But, you know, that's not possible just immediately, like, unless you train harder than everybody else, unless you train like an elite athlete, you're not going to perform like an elite athlete. Like, you, you can't just come off the street and break a world record. You have to live a life uh, for, that is focused on that one goal and live that life for year after year after year until that the breaking a world record is with, even within the realm of possibility, we all want to be like Jesus. You know, we, we want to have his wisdom and be filled with the, his spirit, but most of us don't have the time to grow in wisdom. We don't take the time to grow in wisdom. You know, we, we want to experience intimacy with God and just feel his presence, but we don't spend much time in prayer, do we? We want to have scripture on the forefront of our minds, 
but we don't actually spend much time studying or memorizing Scripture, do we? We want to be a patient and loving and kind person, but we fill our souls with worldly entertainment, whether the characters in shows and movies are, are sarcastic and mean and biting and you know, tearing each other down rather than building each other up. We're filling our minds with that. You know, so, so we intend what is right. We want to be like Jesus, but we avoid the life that would make it a reality. That's the truth. Jesus isn't offering us here in, the, in this passage, he's not offering us a cheat code. He, he isn't offering us a shortcut. Shortcut. He isn't offering us a bailout or a free pass in life. Those things don't exist in real life. When it comes to experiencing the, the, the rest that Jesus promised, Jesus says, I will give you rest. There's no shortcut to that. If you want to live life in a state of, of that God, godly restfulness, if you want to experience peace in the midst of a storm, if you want your soul to be free and light, then you have to put on the yoke of Jesus. You have to live the life that he lived. Earlier this year, we, we spent some time exploring some different spiritual disciplines and habits, and we're going to continue to do that as a church. That's going to be a regular activity for us, is exploring these, these habits that Jesus had in his own life, whether it's, it's prayer or silence and solitude or, or fasting or observing Sabbath, which is, you know, resting and community, simplicity, hospitality, service. Like, there's so many different things. And, and so those are things that Jesus did in his life. Not just because it seemed like a good idea at the time, but because those were the activities, those were the habits, the ways of living that allowed him to live the life that he did. That is his way of life, his heart for life. And that is the, his yoke for us as well. And, and if, if you think about a yoke, it's a work instrument. It's, it's usually a heavy thing laid on oxen to help them work. And so when Jesus says this, it's kind of, he's kind of using a, a kind of irony, saying that the yoke laid on his disciples is an, a non-yoke, for it is a yoke of kindness. It's, it's, it's easy. It's not a burden. So, you know, who can resist this? Uh, Dane Ortland, the, the guy that, that wrote this book, Gentle and Lowly, he, he, he says, you know, that, that the, this idea that it's a yoke is usually a heavy burden, but Jesus' yoke isn't. He gives an example, kind of an illustration for this, uh, you know, a story like where, where there's a drowning man and he must put on the burden of a life preserver, uh, you know, so you throw him the life preserver. Hey, put this on. And, and, and he instead shouts back, he's sputtering, Whoa, no way, not me. This is hard enough drowning in these stormy waters. The last thing I need is the added burden of a life preserver around my body. Which is funny, you know, it's ironic, like, no, you need the life preserver if you want to live, but he sees it as a burden. Oh, man. So we laugh at that guy. Oh, what a, what a fool. But we are oftentimes just like that fool, re rejecting the life preserver. That's what we're like. We confess Jesus with our lips, but generally we avoid the deep fellowship with him. We believe in Jesus, yes, but we don't align our life to be like his life. We so often don't realize that he's trying to help us. I was trying to help my daughter, Anne, you can't swim, don't swim to the deep end. I'm trying to help her, not burden her with more rules. You know, we, we look at Jesus' life, and, and a lot of times I'm sure you say in your mind or something like, man, I could never live like that. Simplify my life? No way. Like my stuff, my schedule, I don't think I can do that. Praying daily? Whoa, 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 whoa. Fasting regularly? Mm, I don't have time for that, and I don't want to make time for that. Having regular times of, of silence and solitude in my life? Mm, no, that sounds horrible, right? I, I've actually heard people say that to me. S serving others sacrificially? Yeah, okay, I can do that sometimes, maybe, when I feel like it. <laughs> That's what we think. Those are the thoughts we have. Uh, those are thoughts I have. I'm being honest with you. You know, so, so with our lips, we confess Jesus, but with our lives, we live like the rest of the world. And we wonder, uh, we wonder, why am I so tired? Why am I struggling with anxiety? Why can't I sleep? Why, why am I struggling with all these emotional issues, depression or whatever? Why are my relationships hanging on by a thread? Like <laughs> Jesus says, 
Come to me, all you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. The only trade-off is put on my yoke and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. Only when you put on the yoke will you find rest. My yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. William Barclay tells a story that, that illustrates how a burden can be light and easy to bear. And I'm almost done here. Uh, a man comes across this boy. He's a, a man's walking down the road. He sees this boy who's carrying a, an, an even smaller boy on his back. And that smaller boy is lame. And so that's why he's carrying him. And so the man walks up to the boy and says, oh, man, that, that's a heavy burden for you to be carrying, young man. And the boy responds, that's no burden. That's my wee brother. And that's, that's how we should view the, the way of Jesus, the yoke of Jesus. Like, it doesn't have to be a burden. If, 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 if the, the yoke is given in love, and if we carry it with love, then the burden is light. It's my wee brother. I want to do this. And, and it's, it's worth doing it. So as I mentioned, as a church, we will be consistently exploring these various spiritual disciplines and habits over the months and years to come. The way of Jesus and during these seasons, we'll, we'll be practicing different habits. And, and for instance, in September, we're, we're going to do a, a six-week series on the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to dive deeper and, and have actually practice praying at home, at church. Um, not just the Lord's Prayer, but just praying in general. Also in September, we're launching two com brand new community groups uh, that will be using emotionally healthy spirituality curriculum. And really what that is, is it, it's a study that everybody in the church should go through, I believe, and we're going to offer it every year, so you will have an opportunity to. But all it is, it's really, it's, it's just showing people how to practically begin to live a life that's, that, ref, that reflects the life of Jesus and the life that he's calling you to live, to, to experience that rest, that peace. But this morning, as, as we prepare to take communion, and as the worship team comes up, think about this yoke Jesus offers you. It's not an escape from life. It's a way to live life, life to the full. So this morning, I just encourage you, I invite you to surrender to Jesus. Accept the life that he's calling you to live. Stop trying to have one foot in both kingdoms and, 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 one, and one kingdom and the other foot in, in the other kingdom, you know, the world and, and the kingdom of God. Stop trying to act like you know better or that, oh, I can make it work. I can... You know, I don't have to give up all that stuff. I don't have to organize my life completely around the habits of Jesus. I just encourage you, surrender to God. Let God speak to your heart. Let his spirit nourish your soul. Receive rest and healing, forgiveness and strength and joy and peace. Accept his way of life and begin to learn how to carry his yoke. Learn how to live life in the way, in the heart of Jesus. It's worth it. I promise you. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for Jesus, that he not only died on the cross for our sins, but that he also modeled how to live. And he's empowered us with your spirit so that we can actually live that way. So God, we, we ask this morning that you your spirit would be strong in us, that you would fill us with your spirit. Open our eyes to the, to the things in our life that we need to change. Open our eyes to things that we need to cut out or things that we need to add or, or ways that we can live more like Jesus and give us the courage, give us the strength, give us the energy, give us the, just the obedience to do what you're calling us to do, to not just confess you with our mouth, but that our lives would confess you as well. So God, we give our lives to you. Help us to take your yoke on us and to follow you in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So we, we take communion every week as a church because uh, it's necessary to realign our hearts and our minds and our lives on Jesus. And so as we take communion today, this, this subject is great of, of, you know, how will you respond to Jesus? Will you just be fascinated in him or will you have faith in him? Will you take on his yoke, his way of life? And so communion was started by Jesus with his disciples the night before that he was betrayed. He, he, he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
In the same way, he took the cup, and the cup represents his blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So as you come forward through the, the side aisles and go back to your seat on the outside or through the, the middle aisle, take the elements, sit down, and, and have that moment with God. The worship team will be playing, but, but pray, surrender yourself to God. Let his spirit wash over you and nourish you. Draw close to him. God is real, and he wants to speak to you. He wants to lead you and guide you in life. And so let's let him do that. So come forward and take communion. in grace and mercy there is nowhere we can hide from your love you are steadfast never failing you are faithful all creation is in awe of who you are you're the healer of the sick and the broken you are comfort for every heart that mourns. Our King and our Savior forever. For eternity we will sing of all you've done. For eternity we will sing of all you've done. God God for us. 
nothing can come against. No one can stand between us. God with us. God for us. Nothing can come against. No one can stand between us. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, just as a reminder, tonight we do have our worship night um, in Potluck, so it's going to be a really good time. Come. Hope to see everybody there. Um, real quick announcement. Uh, this week is Vacation Bible School here as well, which is also very exciting. Um, so um, in order to prepare for that, um, if I could just ask if if you're able to, to once we're done here, just help stack the chairs and push them over to the side so that they have room to do what they need to in the sanctuary this week. Um, other than that, um, I have one more word for you from Pastor Jared. So let's go ahead and see what he has to say. All right, so even though I may not be with you physically, I still want to give you a blessing as you go out this morning. Uh, so go ahead and stand to your feet and receive this blessing. And if you have questions about following Jesus and, and just everything about the, today's subject, uh, fill out a Connect card and, and drop it off in, in the box in the back of the room. Uh, I would love to, to connect with you. Maybe we can have coffee together and talk about it. Um, but, but yeah, I, I'm here for you. Uh, I'm, I'm actually flying back, arriving Monday morning. So tomorrow morning, I'll be back here to meet with you. Uh, but with that, stand your feet, receive this blessing. May our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came with grace and truth, also fill your hearts with grace and truth as you serve him in the days ahead. And may the joy of the Lord, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be your strength. Amen and amen. Be blessed and be a blessing. I love you all.